Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just going to make the 3.2 add puzzle regardless if we have school or not tomorrow. Uh, just so I don't have to come up to the school and uh, do this in a winter storm because the Wi-Fi at my place is terrible. So 3.2 is titled The Structure of the Atom. And so some of the main ideas we're going to go over that atoms contain positive as well as negative particles. Atoms are small. They're dense. They have a positively charged nuclei. Uh, nucleus contains protons and neutrons. And then end with what, what is a radii. So um, and, and the unit that they, they use to describe the radii, radii. So the structure of an atom, it has a nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you have neutrons and protons. Uh, so protons carry a positive charge. Neutrons carry a neutral charge, or no charge at all. Outside the nucleus, we have subatomic particles that orbit it, and they have a negative charge. And these are called electrons. So what I'm going to do now is talk about how did scientists discover electrons, um, protons, and neutrons. So how did they discover the, the, these three subatomic particles and the properties that pertain to them? So we're going to start off with J.J. Thompson and cathode ray tubes. So the first discovery of a subatomic particle was uh, actually the electron, and it was discovered in the late 1800s. And a lot, uh, a lot of the experiments at that time dealt with electric current passing through a lot of gases at some low pressures. And um, as you can see here, this is a rough diagram of, of a cathode tube. Now we actually have one in class, so when we are back in person, I will gladly demonstrate this experiment uh, for you. And in fact, I'm going to need some help carrying it out because I, I can't do, I, I don't have enough hands. So a cathode ray tube uh, is this, this air at a very low pressure. In fact, it's almost in a vacuum, almost. And you can find cathode ray tubes in old television sets, like the big ones, like the backs, they're super, super big. But what they were doing is they were sending the current through a cathode ray tube, and they see this like green laser beam. And um, they notice that if you apply a magnet, okay, um, the rays were deflected away from the negatively charged object. And they're like, well, wait a minute. Um, so magnets, you know, they have a, a positive end and a negative end. And here we have this beam of electrons, ele electricity going through this cathode ray tube and they're being deflected. So what do you know about magnets and their forces? Well, like forces repel each other. So if this is the negative end of a magnet, well, that means that this beam that they're looking at uh, has to be negative as well. And so it, it deflected. So this meant that, and I know my picture uh, goes in front of this word here, this meant that the particles were negative, negatively charged. And these particles were the electrons. So we'll, we can actually do this experiment in class. So J.J. Thompson discovered that electrons uh, existed and that they had a negative charge. Now, another scientist that kind of adds to this, uh, Robert Millikan. Robert Millikan decided to measure that charge of the electron. So we knew that they were negative, but we didn't know how negative they were. And so I'm going to post this link in the Ed Puzzle. Please watch it. It's only uh, 73 seconds, and they do a great job explaining his experiment. In fact, it's actually quite fascinating, but here's the setup of it. And what they did is they suspended these oil droplets into this container. Actually, it's two containers, one on top and one on bottom. And they had a very, very small opening uh, between the, the, or in the barrier. And these oil droplets um, are charged. So as they pass through this metal plate that's positive, they become charged. And then he um, sub subjected it uh, to, oh, what is this? Um, oh, there it is. Radiation. And he looked at it in a microscope. And the, the oil droplets, if they were charged, they would like, if they're negatively charged, they'd actually float back up or slow down. And then they would turn off the voltage and the oil droplets would fall um, as they would based on mass and gravity. But then when he turned on the current again, then the oil droplets became charged. And then they would slow their descent and float. And figuring out the, the charge of it um, actually led to figuring out the mass of an electron. And, and both the charge and the mass of an electron are extremely small. Um, I'm just going to see if it's listed in your book for the charge of an electron. I know they say it in the, the short video. So the charge of an electron just says minus one. Okay. But the mass of an electron is really, really small. 
9.109 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Now, if electrons are really like that small, well then what makes up the rest of the mass of this, of this atom? So two inferences made by the atomic structure. First off, when you just look at an atom found in nature, a lot of times they're neutral. So here we have a negative charge. Well, there's got to be a positive charge that balances it out. And then the second assumption is that these electrons have less mass than the atoms themselves. So what other half or the rest of the mass, what is it made up of? And so atoms must contain some other particles that account for that mass that's not accounted for. So J.J. Thompson, um, back to J.J. Thompson and, and his cathode ray tubes, uh, decided to propose a plum pudding model. Now we've, we've talked about mo models in science, how they help re represent an idea, maybe the idea that it's represented, you know, is about something small in nature, like atoms. Atoms are really, really small. And so if we have a model, it helps us visualize how an atom is put together. Well, in his first idea, uh, he decided that it, it represented a plum pudding. A plum pudding was a dessert at the time. Basically, it was like a cake or kind of a mushy, I don't want to say it's figgy pudding, but it had like nuts and raisins and a bunch of other garbage, in my personal opinion, um, scattered throughout and the, the crap, the yucky stuff, because I'm just not a big fan of that all, um, would be your negative electron or the plums, okay? And then the rest of it, the pudding, um, would be considered the positive part of it. So he proposed this model, and this model didn't stay very long uh, because we discovered new information, and then our model had to change. So moving on to the nucleus. Nucleus, we know that is, it's small and it's dense and it's positively charged. So... With the work of Ernest Rutherford, Hans Geiger, and Ernest Marsden, uh, they put together a gold foil experiment. And the gold foil experiment, basically what they did was they bombarded a thin piece of gold foil with a narrow beam of alpha particles. Now these alpha particles have a positive charge four times the mass of hydrogen. And they assumed that the mass and charge were evenly distributed, distributed, sorry, uh, throughout throughout, going back to J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model. But what they noticed was that some of the particles were deflected straight back at the source of the alpha particles. And Rutherford was like, how is this happening? Why is the deflection coming straight back at me? And so he reasoned that the deflection was caused by a small, densely packed bundle of matter that was positively charged because positive and positive don't care for each other. They repel, and that was the result of this repulsion. Now, I know these are a bunch of words, and maybe it doesn't really make sense, so I'm hoping this diagram on the next slide shows. So here is their gold foil, and they, they cut this gold foil literally just to a couple atoms thick. So this diagram just shows one atom thick. So these are this is one atom of gold, another atom, so there's four atoms of gold here, and it's a thin slice of it. And these are the beams of alpha particles, and you can see that as it hits the nucleus, the positively densely packed region, we get small deflection. Sometimes the alpha particles would completely miss it and travel straight on through. Um, and then there were some that uh, were literally, when it hits, we get a very large deflection and sometimes just straight back. And so you can kind of see that here. And then they collected or figured out where those alpha particles hit um, using this detecting screen. So the expected results was that if the negative and the positive um, charges were evenly distributed, kind of like in that plum pudding model, then these alpha particles should just go straight on through. But that was not the case. We got a lot of weird deflections. And so they were like, what's going on here? Oh, a nucleus must be densely packed. That's where you find all the positive charges of it. So the nucleus contains protons and neutrons. So we know that the nucleus has a positive charge. And using hydrogen, we could figure out the mass of that positively charged region because hydrogen is just one proton and one neutron. So the mass number of hydrogen um, is 1.01. And using some math, they figured out that the proton is roughly equal to the mass of a neutron. Um, in this case, 1.673 times 10 to negative 27 kilograms. And the neutron, 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. You can see that both the proton and the, and the neutron here uh, have masses way greater than the electron. In fact, over 1,836 times greater than that. 
So both the protons and neutrons, they are pretty much equal in size to each other or mass, but extremely larger than an electron. Now remember, the number of protons an element has determines the type of element. It's tied into its atom's identity. So a nucleus that has uh, that's full of positive charges would mean that the repulsion should be unstable because it's filled with protons. I mean, if I take a look at gold, right? Gold is, the atomic number is 79. So that means it has 79 protons in its nucleus. Well, geez, that's a lot of positive subatomic particles. That, that nucleus should literally pull apart or, you know, be unstable. Uh, however, there is a force that helps keep it together, and it, it's called the nuclear force. So it says the short range of the proton-neutron attraction, proton-proton forces, and the neutron-neutron forces hold the nucleus particles together. The nucleus, not the nucleus, sorry, the neutrons give it just enough space between each proton uh, so that they don't repel across each other, or from each other. Okay, final slide, radii of atoms is expressed in picometers or PM. Uh, so the radius, by definition, is the distance of the center to the outer portion of the electron cloud, basically the end of the electrons. So that is the radius of an atom, really. So that was uh, 8.2. All I did was talk about the discovery of electrons, how it led to... Um, the discovery of protons and neutrons. It's a really, really short section. I, it wouldn't be a bad idea to read the pages, pages 74 to 78 in your book. Um, but then remember, Friday uh, will be a work day for the 3.1, 3.2 worksheets. So that does it for 3.2.